Uh, thank you to everyone for joining us here today. My name is Ali Kincaid. I'm the manager of Cabinet Communications. And um, we have a media briefing for you today uh, with um, some of our cabinet ministers. And uh, I just want to ask a quick note before we get started that you all mute your microphones if you haven't already. Um, and when you're called upon, you can unmute yourself uh, to ask your question following, uh, following our, our opening remarks here. Uh, speaking this afternoon will be uh, Premier Carolyn Cochran, uh, Minister of Health and Social Services, Julie Green, uh, Minister of Education, Culture and Employment, RJ Simpson, Minister of Municipal and Community Affairs, Shane Thompson, as well, our Chief Public Health Officer, Dr. Tammy Candola. And on the call as well today, we have Kim Riles, who is the CEO of the Northwest Territories uh, Health uh, and Social Services Authority. Um, so uh, I would like to also mention that um, following their remarks, we will go uh, in, in order. We will ask each um, media outlet to ask one, one question as well as one follow-up question. I will identify you based on your media outlet. Uh, and so if you can be prepared with your question when we do that, um, that would be great. And you'll get one opportunity for a follow-up as well. Um, and. Uh, if you have issues with your microphone, please do use the chat function to type your question in, in there and we'll make sure your question is asked. Uh, if you do have a question for a specific uh, member of our panel today, please do uh, direct your question directly to them. Let us know who you would like that question directed to. Uh, if not, we will try to provide um, uh, direction on, on who the question should be going to. Uh, with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Premier Cochran to deliver opening remarks. Thank you, Ali. Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for being here today. When we released Emerging Wisely 2021, we understood that there would be a likelihood of an increase in cases within our borders. We would be able to implement targeted restrictions to help limit the spread of the virus without having to plunge the territory back into restrictions like we saw at the beginning of the pandemic. This is why this Chief Public Health Officer made the decision to close the schools in Yellowknife, Dila, Dilo, and Dada for the next 10 days. We know this is difficult for parents, caregivers, teachers, and everyone in the education system. We hoped we wouldn't have to ask you to go through this type of uncertainty again. However, like you have continuously throughout this pandemic, we need you to come together as a community to help limit the spread of the virus and protect those who can't get vi vaccinated. If you can help a friend, family, or neighbor during this time, please do so. As Northerners, we're known for coming together to support those who are in need at any given time. It's what makes the North so special. I want to take a moment to talk about the outbreak facing the underhoused population. Comments on social media about the outbreak facing our most vulnerable have been largely negative. Some have said to lock them up and don't let them leave. This is not the Northern way. As many of us know, spending a significant period of time in isolation can be challenging. This is especially true for our vulnerable population, many of whom struggle with issues like mental health and addictions that likely stem from the impacts of colonization and the residential school system. We have to strike a balance between education and enforcement to ensure that people stay in the isolation centers where monitoring and proper supports are in place. The historical trauma that many of the most vulnerable have experienced in their lives make the situation more complex. We need to take a trauma-informed and compassionate approach to build the trust needed to ensure the vulnerable population feels safe enough to stay. We've always said the health and well-being of residents is a top priority of this government, and that hasn't changed. The COVID-19 Coordinating Secretary is working closely with the Northwest Territories Health and Social Services Authority to ensure that clinical, social, and administrative supports are provided to help vulnerable people to self-isolate safely. The coming weeks are going to be challenging, but please, no matter how hard it gets, please be kind. This is a difficult time for us all, and the best way we can get through this is with compassion and patience. On that, I'd like to turn it over to Minister Green. Thank you. Uh, 
I believe Minister Green is just uh, rejoining the call here momentarily. So we'll just, uh, perhaps we will go to uh, Minister Simpson and, oh, there's Minister Green. Okay, go ahead, Minister Green. Yeah, sorry, my uh, computer kicked me out. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. As Premier Cochran has just explained, the outbreak is worsening each day in communities across the NWT and here in Yellowknife. Despite our best efforts to slow the spread of this virus, case counts are still rising, and we have many vulnerable residents, including unvaccinated children under 12 years old, who must be protected. We have reached levels of community transmission in the Yellowknife, Beshoko, and Wati. That means any public place in these communities is a potential exposure location. Our system is feeling the strain from increased demand for testing, contact tracing, and medical care for those experiencing severe symptoms from COVID-19. That is why it is imperative that we take these extraordinary steps to contain the spread of the virus now. Dr. Candela will speak momentarily about the specifics of these measures, including school closures, but I would like to emphasize the importance of following these public health orders especially the masking order and recommendations. Right now, I want to speak to all the health and social services professionals across the NWT. You are doing a great job while working very hard each day to ensure residents have the care, information and services they need. Your commitment to complete testing and contact tracing as the outbreak has worsened has been incredible. And we are grateful for your dedication. In the face of every challenge, you continue to rise to the occasion, and I want you to know we recognize your efforts and we thank you. We know that these measures are especially challenging for those of you who need care. That's why NTHSSA has scaled down services today to develop a plan for continued services while schools remain closed in Yellowknife, Dead Atlan Deal. Further details about service levels will be announced as soon as they're available. To employers of essential workers in communities affected by school closures, we ask for your flexibility and understand as you coordinate staff schedules. To parents of school-aged children, we ask for your patience as we work to contain the spread and keep you and your children safe. And to all NWT residents, we ask for your compassion and kindness. If you can reach out to help your family, friends, or neighbors, I encourage you to do that. Let's all lend a hand when and where we can to help one another out during these difficult times. I would now like to turn the microphone to Minister Simpson to provide an update from the Department of Education, Culture, and Employment. Thank you. Thank you, Minister Green. Earlier this week, the Office of the Chief Public Health Officer amended the COVID-19 gatherings public health order to include all schools in Yellowknife, Deda, and Dilo. This means that in-class learning is suspended in these communities from September 14th to September 24th. All schools in the NWT have safety plans approved by the Office of the Chief Public Health Officer to limit introduction and transmission of COVID-19. However, recognizing that the COVID-19 situation outside of schools is growing, the Office of the Chief Public Health Officer has made the decision to shift to remote learning in Yellowknife, Deda, and Dilo. To, to prevent COVID-19 from entering the schools. The closures are not a reflection on the schools themselves whose efforts implementing their safety plans and protecting students have been commendable and I thank them for their work during these challenging times. We recognize that this situation is not ideal for learning and will undoubtedly cause a great deal of stress for many people. However, our number one priority continues to be the health and safety of our students, staff and communities. What remote learning looks like will depend on students' grade levels and individual needs. Some students will access their education through online platforms, some through paper-based packages, and for some, it will be a combination of both. We are working with education bodies to ensure that students have the supports they need, including access to computers and the internet. Over the coming weeks, we will continue to work with the Office of the Chief Public Health Officer, education leaders, and schools to provide support and guidance as necessary. I wanna thank all staff, educators and students for their efforts to ensure that quality education can continue. With that, I will now hand the floor over to Minister Thompson. Thank you, Minister Simpson. 
Um, I'd like to make some brief comments about the on, our ongoing emergency response, the current pandemic outbreak. GNW continues to support communities as they use their emergency response plans to guide <clears throat> their work to help prevent further spread of COVID-19. Many communities continue to have their local emergency management organization or EMO in place and may still have their local state of emergency activated. Local EMOs are supported by the GNWT's regional and territorial EMOs, all which are active, acted, activated to provide adv advice, information, support, including coordination of the GNWT assistance. Recently, territorial EMO activity has been focused on working with other GNW departments to establish an isolation center at the Yellowknife Ski Club. This facility will be operational this week. I'd like to thank our partners at the Ski Club for their help and their quick response to our request to use their facilities. The territorial EMO is also working with other GNW departments and the City of Yellowknife to establish a temporary shelter at the Yellowknife Community Arena. This facility is also expected to be operational this week and this establishment reflects a significant work by all partners to address an issue that is concerning to all of us. There is considerable work underway within the GNWT to ensure that staff are available to support individuals at the shelters. I can confirm that yesterday a request for assistance was made to the Public Safe Safety Canada for surge capacity maintained shelter operations in Yellowknife. This request was made for 20 personnel for the Canadian Red Cross to provide non-clinical support by supplying emergency response team responders or emergency care workers who can fill a general support role. Shelter operates, operations would be led by the GNWT who will be responsible for managing and operating the shelter. We have not yet received a response, but we expect a positive one soon. Staff have been engaged in discussions with the Canadian Red Cross at this emergency, emerging situation has developed and the Canadian Red Cross has identified that they do have capacity to provide this requested support. In closing, I'd like to thank communities and the residents for the work that they are doing to help prevent further spread of the virus and to follow the CPHO's orders and recommendations. With, the, with this in mind, I would like to turn the microphone to Dr. Condola. Thank you. Good afternoon. Yesterday, as COVID activity intensified in Yellowknife, I modified the COVID-19 gatherings public health order to prevent further introduction and transmission of COVID-19 in schools in Yellowknife, Deda and Ndilo. The order, order requires remote learning for the student population in these communities. This includes junior kindergarten to grade 12, as well as colleges and trade schools. I also extended the duration of the gathering order to Friday, September 24, at, until 11.59 p.m. Every school in the Northwest Territories follows safety guidelines approved by the Office of the Chief Public Health Officer. And these measures limit the introduction and transmission of COVID-19. These measures have worked well. However, widespread community transmission is impacting the capacity to respond in a timely fashion. The Delta variant transmits quickly, and we are seeing severe outcomes in those who are not fully vaccinated. I want to take the opportunity to acknowledge that schools across the NWT have done a very good job of following this direction. Without the support of school administration and the Department of Education, Culture and Employment, as well as parents and students, we would not have protected students for as long as we have. Having said that, the situation in some NWT communities warrants stronger action at this time. This is because of increased community transmission and the inability to contain the spread of COVID-19. The COVID-19 situation in the NWT has intensified and is affecting more NWT residents each day. The objective of shifting to remote learning is to prevent COVID-19 from entering and spreading throughout the schools. Let me be clear, every step being taken by my office at this time has to be as meant to prevent severe COVID outcomes, 
prevent societal disruption, and to protect priority populations, such as children under 12, who are not eligible for vaccination. So here's the current situation. We have more than 70 people with COVID-19 who are under a house or work to support this population. We have had the introduction of COVID-19 into four schools, including one school outbreak. And in the past month alone, we've had 16 hospitalizations, five ICU admissions, and one death. Due to the sheer number of people with COVID-19, there isn't capacity for timely investigation and identification of contacts. So we do need more protective measures. And in Beitroko and Wati, these measures were containment orders. In Yellowknife, we have amended the order to shift to remote learning. We have tried very hard to keep schools open. Attending school supports the development and socialization of children. It offers working parents the ability to continue working to support their families. And it provides an important social safety net for children. Shifting to remote learning has consequences, we must all consider. And this pandemic is forcing us to make difficult decisions. We are trying to navigate the path of least harm until we are able to bring community transmission back under control. Finally, an isolation order was introduced yesterday that clearly outlines what is required when a person has COVID-19 and must isolate. The order states that those diagnosed with COVID-19 must do the following. Stay in the indoor portion of your isolation location for 10 days, unless you are advised otherwise by a public health official or your healthcare provider. Do not leave the indoor portion of your isolation location unless you need to seek medical attention. And if you need medical attention, contact your healthcare provider and follow their instructions. Do not have any visitors at your isolation location. If you are at risk of more severe disease or outcomes, monitor yourself worsening or severe symptoms. Call 911 if you do develop severe symptoms and let them know you have tested positive for COVID-19 or that you are experiencing symptoms of COVID-19. These are difficult things to ask of people, especially people who are struggling with any health issue, including mental health and addictions. We know that it makes it even more difficult to isolate for this particular population. But the COVID Secretariat and THSA and the Department of Health and Social Services are working together to provide supports for people who are sick with COVID-19. This sort of brings to the forefront the importance of helping people safely isolate, but involving compliance and enforcement issues and measures when necessary. We are currently seeing the results of the stresses on our healthcare capacity. We have increased numbers of people in the hospital and ICU. We have managed this pandemic with public health orders and restrictions that have ensured that NWT remained as safe as possible until enough people have been vaccinated. And this allows us to protect as many people as possible. While we are seeing better vaccination rates, especially in Yellowknife, the fight is not over until schools and classrooms are safe too. So once again, I am pleading with everyone to do their part, make smart choices and follow healthy habits. We know that these are big asks, especially this far down the road into the pandemic. Caring for kids at home again, while many of you also have to work from home or sacrifice work entirely to care for these young children can be challenging. But we are doing this to keep NWT residents safe, especially the children. And we are almost there, so stay the course. And we will get through this together. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Ken Villa. Uh, that wraps up our, our opening remarks section of the briefing this morning. I'm now going to uh, open it up to the Q&A portion. And I have a list of media in front of me. So I'm going to begin with uh, CKLB. I believe it's Mariah from CKLB here this morning or this afternoon. Mariah, do you have a question? Hello, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you so much. I was curious to know if we had an update as to how much longer we can expect our health services in Yellowknife, Indilo, and Deta to be impacted by the shortages. Uh, thanks, Mariah. Uh, thanks, Mariah. 
Sorry, a little bit of feedback Sorry, there. Feedback there. I'm going to direct I'm going that to direct that question. Imrail. Imrail. Thank you, Ali. Thank you, Ali. With a lot of feedback. a lot of feedback. Should I just pause? Should I just Try again, Kim. I've muted uh, Mariah, so go ahead. Okay, thanks. That's better. Um, so there, there's obviously a huge impact based uh, as a result of the school closures that impacted us today specifically, um, as of course many of our healthcare providers and our workers in uh, Yellowknife are also parents or caregivers of children. So we had to take immediate measures to create capacity to ensure that the critical things that needed to happen today went forward and to be able to uh, allow people to get childcare plans into place. So we anticipate that we'll be issuing um, updated service level announcements today to let folks know uh, what, what they can expect in the coming days. Um, but overarchingly, there will be some ongoing service impacts, not directly related to the school closure, but just to the overall COVID-19 uh, outbreak management that we alluded to and we announced last week. And those will be ongoing uh, until such a time as we uh, see a decrease in the number of cases and are able to uh, resume more normal operations uh, um, based on uh, the overarching situation. Thank you, Kim. Um, Mariah, do you have a follow-up question? Sure, yes, thank you. Is there any way you could elaborate a little bit more as to what some of those specifics might be or? do not have those ready yet um, um specific that's related to immediate service immediate impact? service impact exactly how long we can expect the services to be so limited hence and so forth yeah so yeah we, so we, I, sorry i'll let you mute it again maybe ali we're good yeah go ahead okay thanks um, I haven't had an update today. All of the COOs have been meeting with their staff and in determining what the operational impacts will be. So there will be, as I said before, an announcement today of service level uh, impacts from today and onward. Um, from what I was advised, we had already switched to pretty much uh, a, a virtual care wherever possible and primary care services here in Yellowknife. And so that will continue. Um, but the other area uh, that we've seen uh, significant operational impact in terms of child care needs is actually in our specialist clinic at Stanton. So we have been moving to transition to some of the care from that facility or from that service uh, to virtual care. And I will get an update today in terms of whether there will be ongoing impact beyond just today or whether we'll be able to resume more normal levels of operation in that specific service. Thank you. Thanks, Kim, and thank you, Mariah. Uh, just a reminder to media, if um, if you can unmute yourself quickly when you're asking your question and then put yourself back on mute, one trick on Zoom is you can hold down the space bar if you're using a computer or laptop. Uh, you can just hold down the space bar while you talk, and then when you let it go, you'll be back on mute. Um, next, I'm going to go to uh, Northern News Services. Alyssa, are you there? Do you have a question? Hi, yes, I do. Um, just uh, this, this question uh, could probably be best answered uh, by Dr. Condola. Um, Dr. Condola, I'm, I just have uh, a clarifying question about uh, isolation requirements for those who test positive for COVID-19. Uh, I'm, I'm wondering how uh, multi, uh, uh, people who are in um, roommate situations who, uh, who need to who need to be isolated? Does that mean that they need to uh, stay inside the home proper, or stay inside uh, an isolated area within that home uh, to avoid testing others? Um, can you clarify, um, people who are in what kind of situations? I just didn't get that word thing. Oh, oh, sorry. Apologies. Um, <laughs> Uh, uh, for example, uh, adults living uh, living with other adults uh, who uh, may not who have who have, uh, so if someone tests positive uh, and they are and they are living 
uh, with other people who have not tested positive or perhaps not showing symptoms, um, how should that be handled um, as far as reporting and isolation requirements? So specifically with the protocol is that if someone tests positive for COVID, they would be called by um, Operation of Public Health Services, um, whatever community it is, um, or the, the health center if there's no public health there, and then they do an individual risk assessment. So they will um, talk to the person um, who, and do a detailed contact tracing history, do a detailed history to find out when this person was infectious, look at their living arrangement. And so if they're in a living arrangement where um, people fully vaccinated versus people who are not fully vaccinated, and if that individual can isolate away from others, and if they can't safely isolate, um, they may be medically biased to seek an alternate location. It's just, it's, it is complex, and this is why you need that individual public health assessment whenever someone's positive, because um, what you want to do is have that person safely isolate, not transmit the virus to other people, keep the household contacts safe, and um, some of them would have to isolate if they're not fully vaccinated, but if some people are fully vaccinated and they can safely isolate, they can continue self-monitoring. But those kind of details um, depends on the person testing positive and their living situation. Thanks, Dr. Candola. Uh, Alyssa, do you have a follow-up question? Sure, sure. Uh, I just wanted to, sorry, I didn't, I didn't raise it very well. Um, I just wanted to clarify, I was looking for uh, what to, what people should do in light of uh, the, the, I guess, current overburdening of, of the, um, of the, the COVID-19 uh, testing and uh, contact tracing system. Just because there is, you, you have acknowledged that there is going to be that, that lag time uh, in communication there, just because of volume is are there are there any is are there any changes uh, I, I guess in that situation uh, to uh, that would kind of take that into account so specifically on the operational response on um, whether capacity would impact individual assessments I'm going to direct that to Ms. Riles to respond to but what I do want to recommend uh, specifically in Yellowknife, is that anyone who's got symptoms of COVID, they, they do need to isolate until they get assessed. And, um, and getting assessed um, is, and also includes testing. What is unique about Yellowknife right at this moment is that we have um, three, two or three weeks ago, maybe three weeks ago, it's all like so quick. We started out with one individual under house to three to 19 to 35 and to about a 60 um, as of yesterday. So it is, it is um, rapidly increasing that population. What we do know is this is a highly mobile population, um, very um, social people share, they, um, they help each other out. And so it is um, a situation where we don't um, have the entire history of their exposure timelines. And so at, at this point in Yellowknife, the, the most prudent thing is if anyone has symptoms of COVID-19, even if um, you, um, you don't, you are fully immunized or you have led a very simple life, just go into the store, get your groceries. Um, we don't know. Um, you could be exposed. The best thing is anybody with symptoms of COVID is to isolate and get assessed. And I will uh, talk to Kim about the current um, delays in assessment or what that approach is, but you, you need to stay isolated as much as possible. So until COVID is ruled out, that would be my recommendation. And if people do that in Yellowknife, we all um, do it in the next 10 days, we will be able to find more cases and delay further transmission. So I really am urging people in DLO data in Yellowknife to uh, monitor the symptoms, stay home and get assessed if you have COVID symptoms. Kim, do you have anything to add regarding the um, operational details there? Um, currently, we're booking about two days in advance for COVID testing. There is the ability to book online through our website, or if you need assistance to book to phone, and you'll be assisted to be able to book. 
Um, if you feel as though you actually need a medical assessment as well as testing potentially, we would encourage you to contact our primary care uh, center. Even though we have sh shifted to virtual care, we do have same day appointments available and those would be most appropriate for anybody who feels that they actually need to see a nurse practitioner or physician as well as get tested. And certainly anybody who's experiencing any type of medical distress or feels that their symptoms are urgent, they can call 911 or they can present to our emergency department for assessment. We do have COVID, uh, rapid COVID testing available in our primary care, as well as our emergency department. Um, so those, uh, those folks that are presenting through any of those streams would be able to, uh, to get tested for COVID. Thank you, Kim, and thank you, Dr. Candola. Uh, next, I'm going to go to uh, Radio Canada. I believe, Mario, you're on the line? Yes, uh, my question is for Dr. Candola. Uh, we, we know we've been having community transmission in Yellowknife. We knew the resources were getting tighter. So I'm just trying to understand what was the major shift yesterday that made you uh, close the schools. I, I'm trying to see, do you think there, there could have been a, another way to do it without uh, being such a surprise for the parents that had to, you know, get up from work and realize that they had to figure out something to do tomorrow or today? Um, so yeah, that's, that's my question. Like what major shift did you see between Sunday or Monday or, or last, last week to, uh, to yesterday? So when we were looking in mid-August, we started to see um, community widespread transmission in Fort Good Hope and Coville Lake. And because of the level of community transmission, we put uh, both communities into containment order and did a second extension. When we did the second extension and that order included school closures, we noticed that there was, we were able to um, stop transmission. Um, the cases in Coville Lake have remained at zero since last week. And for Good Hope, uh, we're having uh, recovered cases. The vast majority have now recovered. At the same time, we increased their immunization coverage. In our normal wells, we noticed the same thing. It, was, it had a higher immunization coverage. It was at 75%. But whereas Coville Lake and Fort Good Hope were under immunized, we didn't anticipate with um, normal wells that we would be able to contain it with a high level of immunization. But the thing with the Delta variant is people have to underestimate how infectious this is, and it will find the pockets of unvaccinated um, populations, and it will spread very quickly. So unfortunately, with normal wells, again, we had to um, put in a containment order, close schools, and then put in a, a second containment order, which ends tonight. And again, that solved the problem. There, there is no further transmission and schools can safely start. So SAW2 has worked out very well with the containment approach. Wachi and Bechoko, there was a rapid increase in cases in the first 24 hours. And given the housing density, given the lower um, immunization coverage, um, we put in a containment order and to be able to manage the problem. With yellow knife, um, we have one of the highest immunization coverages and it was anticipated that um, because this was reaching a specifically under immunized population that we could manage by containing those cases and um, prevent further spread. But has um, over the, the past two or three weeks, the unfortunately, the, the spread and the number of cases intensified in this population and then has spilled over into um, the support staff and their families. And so we, at this point, um, had did our very best to have um, to have the schools open, but as we watched the cases increase, and the Monday we saw again an intense increase in activity, and then we've had um, scenarios, um, recent scenarios of, of breaches in compliance. So we have had COVID cases um, um, breaching their isolation order, so that puts further exposure um, that we need to look at. So with all those scenarios and intensification and undocumented exposure, um, it would it, it came to the point where the wider community transmission would have impacted schools and had to make a decision of closing the schools before we have um, commu uh, school outbreaks in Yellowknife and Delodetta or um, taking it day by day. And um, on Monday, when we saw an amplification of cases, 
it was the most prudent thing was to close the schools even for nine days, they'd rather close the schools and get a handle on this problem, get a decrease in activity, and then we can open the schools safely. But having the schools open with this level of wide community transmission would have led to introduction, many introductions, and at some point, outbreaks. Maybe uh, just Thank you, Dr. follow up. Oh. Yeah, sorry. Uh, yeah, yeah, if Go I ahead, can. Mario. Thank you. Uh, yeah, if I can follow up, I, I guess I'm just trying to, you know, we know that this announcement placed yesterday is putting, a, you know, a bunch of parents and you mentioned uh, health workers, uh, you know, we've had to stop even more the um, the services, the, the health services given in Yellowknife uh, because of that decision. So I, I'm just trying to, I'm, wonder, sorry, I'm just wondering you. if the, there could have been a better way to get this announced without the impacts that we're getting today in the in the health services. Yeah. Go ahead, Dr. Candela. We could have proactively included school closures when we did the gathering order um, a week ago, but that would have uh, prevented uh, four more days of school. The, um, the, bill, the, the problem with the pandemic is we need to pivot when we get the information and so typically when we start to see cases amplify, when we don't have exposure timelines on the vast majority, and we know that there's been exposures and breaches and that there are potential of more widespread exposure, when we start to see families impacted and children starting to test positive, you have to pivot and you have to move quickly. There, unfortunately, there, is, there was no other way than to call, um, to have the schools closed now. A week ago, our approach was to keep schools open because schools have been doing an amazing job and they've been controlling the introduction uh, and we've been doing fine with that method. But knowing the number of active cases and knowing the amount of exposures, it, it would have been um, the, the amount of introduction would have overwhelmed the capacity to isolate. So rather than wait for them to be overwhelmed and develop school outbreaks that would be ongoing was to proactively at this point when you see an amplification of cases and it's not going down and you have um, undocumented exposures and then you also have a, a 48 hour lag period before you can test people, the most prudent thing is to put the safety of the kids paramount and close the sh schools for a short amount of time, nine days, versus to have ongoing outbreaks over the next month until we can get vaccines available. Thank you, Dr. Candola. Uh, next, I'm going to go to uh, Kevin from True North FM. Kevin, are you there? Do you have a question? Or is there someone else from True North FM on the line? I'm going to take that silence as a no. Okay, uh, I'm going to go to CBC next. Natalie, do you have a question from CBC? Hi, thanks very much. Um, yes, I am just looking for a little bit more clarity on some of the new measures that Minister Thompson announced. Um, I guess starting with the isolation center at the Yellowknife Ski Club and the um, temporary shelter at the Yellowknife Community Arena, maybe you could tell us how many people these two facilities will, excuse me, will support and uh, who exactly will benefit from them. Uh, sure, Minister Thompson. Uh, thank you. Um, for the numbers, I would have to get back to you on that. But, oh, do you hear me now? Yes, we can hear you, Minister. Oh, okay, thanks, sorry about that. Um, as for the uh, numbers, I can't give you the exact numbers with the ski club or um, the only Farina, but what it does is it gives us the opportunity to help out with the situation um, where, you know, with the, the ski club, it has the opportunity for people to um, be a little bit more uh, isolated from the hotels um, with our, you know, the challenges that we were facing with some of those individuals, but also the fact um, it just gives them some um, 
I guess, a better place to stay um, where we can uh, monitor and uh, support them uh, moving forward. In regards to the arena, it is ability to allow us to <clears throat> help uh, because we've had a number of closures of other facilities and that opens it up the opportunity for, uh, for uh, that there to provide services to the residents. Thank you. Thank you, Minister Thompson. And uh, I'm just going to open it potentially to Minister Green, just in case you had anything to add regarding the shelter services, Minister Green. Oh, sorry, Minister, you're still on mute. Okay, good now. Um, I, I don't have the numbers either. Um, they are for two different situations, really. The ski club is for people who are medically advised to stay in isolation. The YK arena is more for day sheltering needs. Um, and, uh, and as the minister said, we'll, we'll get back to you with the numbers that can be served in each location. Thank you. Thank you, Minister Green. And Minister Thompson. Um, back to Natalie, do you have a follow-up question? Yes, thanks very much for that. Um, I'm wondering also if you had any more information on uh, the, the Red Cross. I didn't quite understand, was it confirmed that they will be coming up or maybe it was just a request that was sent in um, and maybe, maybe you could say a little bit more about what kind of services they would provide uh, if they did come up here. Sure. Yeah. Minister Thompson, would you like to address that question? Yeah, thank you. Yeah. So we reached out to the um, Red Cross um, through uh, Public Safety Canada um, to um, help us. Um, and in regards to, we haven't got a confirmation um, that they are going to be able to do it, but all indications are is that they're supportive of it. Uh, in regards to what the positions um, we have been requesting, um, the request is up for 20 personnel from Red Cross as a care team comprising of generalists, uh, responders, and safety and well uh, being staff, including 10. Uh, generalist, uh, five uh, per team consisting of responders and safety wellness staff, uh, five additional generalists, a possible third team to support a staggered approach, uh, two team leaders, one for each, uh, one OSA or OHS uh, advisor, uh, one risk advisor, virtual or remote, and one Indigenous uh, specialist. Thank you. Thank you, Minister Thompson. Um, okay, next we have we do have a question from Northern News Services, and um, this is uh, uh, coming in via the chat, so I'm just going to read it out. Uh, the question is: How much longer do we expect the number of cases in Yellowknife to rise, and is there any risk of there being a containment order for the city of Yellowknife? And I assume that's going to go to Dr. Candola. So at this point. We're monitoring the situation daily. We are, we, we have been seeing an increase in the number of active cases in Yellowknife in um, the underhouse population, which uh, makes the exposure that much difficult to trace. And we're, we're starting to see it spread into other Yellowknifers. And so at this point, it, it's hard to know if whether we're still continuing to increase or if we're on the, the downswing. But the most important way is that we need to capture every single case in Yellowknife. So anyone in Yellowknife that has had, that has symptoms needs to be tested um, at least for COVID, but needs to isolate. Because there's a 48 hour uh, current delay in testing, we, we ask that you isolate for those 48 hours until it's determined that you don't have COVID. The quicker we can find the cases, the quicker we can um, isolate them and, and doing um, contact tracing, isolate contacts, the quicker we can end this um, outbreak in Yellowknife. In Satu, they've done quite well. And like I said, um, they no longer have community transmission and they're on the mend. We hope that um, Yellowknife will go in the same way. Thank you, Dr. Candola. Um, the follow-up from True North FM is, uh, with medical shortage happening in the NWT right now, especially due to the schools closing, 
Will the territory be asking for more nurses and medical staff to come down and help? If so, how much? And I'm going to put that question to Kim Riles for now and uh, we'll see if anyone else has anything to add. Uh, thanks, Sally. Uh, so we still do have Canadian Red Cross um, nurses and physicians who are deployed to us. Um, we currently have, I think, 14. We have 14 nurses in the NWT plus two positions. We've ex we are seeking an extent a further extension of that agreement with Canadian Red Cross to take us to the beginning of October to be able to sustain that level of support um, because they've certainly been very helpful. Uh, we have a number of those nurses deployed to the Clicho right now to assist with their outbreak, as well as a number here in Yellowknife in various roles. Um, and, and we also have a physician uh, deployed to the Clicho and one to the Satu as well. So that's been a very helpful resource to us to have in place and certainly, um, certainly looking to extend that arrangement. We actually have a request to, uh, to have around 18 nurses here at any given time, but of course that's always um, subject to the Canadian Red Cross's ability to staff that. So we have the ability to have even more um, and integrate them and put them to work if they are available to come to us from CRC. Thank you, Kim. Uh, next, I'm going to go to Cabin Radio. Is there anyone from Cabin Radio on the, on the line? And do you have a question? Not sure, I don't think we have. I don't think we have anybody there. Uh, okay, we've gone through um, our list. I don't believe I missed any of our media outlets. I have everyone that had uh, RSVP to the event. We don't have time to go back through everyone, but um, I do want to open the floor to our panel in case there are any last uh, comments before we end today's briefing. Um, just want to encourage everyone who's eligible to get vaccinated to stay home if they're sick, get assessed, and um, continue wearing their mask in indoor public spaces. Okay, with that, uh, thank you very much to uh, to all of our, our our participants here today: Premier Cochran, Minister Green, Minister Simpson, Minister Thompson, uh, Dr. Candola. And, uh, and Ms. Riles, thank you very much for joining us today. Um, for the media, thank you for taking the time out of your day to join us. And if you do have any follow-up questions, please do feel free to direct them through the press secretary desk and we will do our best to get you prompt responses on those. Thank you again and uh, enjoy the rest of your afternoon.